Hello, this is Brian Auten from Apologetics 315. Today's interview is with David Horner, professor of philosophy and biblical studies at Biola University. He also serves as research scholar for Centers for Christian Study International, which is an effort to develop intellectual Christian communities within secular university contexts. The purpose of this interview is to explore the topic of faith in academic life, and we'll be doing that by talking about the themes David discusses in his book, Mind Your Faith, A Student's Guide to Thinking and Living Well. Well, thanks for joining me today, David. Uh, Thank you for having me, Brian. Well, you've written a book uh, directed to college and university students, and maybe many have heard statistics saying that something like a majority of Christian students say that they've lost their faith somehow through their college or university experience. So I want to ask you as we start off, what's the challenge that they're facing and what's the problem here? Well, I th- there's there are multiple aspects to it. Uh, the way I like to think about it is that the uh, tendency is for people to go to college and lose their mind, their faith, or their character, or hmm. all three. And uh, so the, in the book, I, I want to talk about all three. The mind is primary uh, because we are rational animals, as the classical thinkers said, uh, rational beings. Everything that we do is shot through with thinking. And so if we don't think well, we are not going to believe well or live well. Uh, and so it's not just a matter of sitting around thinking, but that's going to be fundamental and so how we think about thinking how we think about faith how we think about character is going to be crucial so that we can uh, flourish in in all of those areas Mm -hmm. well there's some good resources out there for those who are going through college and university and they have you know various things that they emphasize from practical to spiritual but your book has this three-part approach you know the mind faith and character so as we go along i'll kind of ask you to uh, unpack those but describe this overall approach and how you develop it through the book okay great thanks i i do want to affirm what you said, that there there are other books, there are some really great books with very specific practical help. What I felt was needed was a way to integrate uh, how to think about these made these three major things, mind, faith, and character, and to do it in an integrated, coherent way. And so what I do, the the book is in those three parts, mind, faith, character, beginning with mind, and most of it is, is about the mind because, as I was saying before, thinking is so basic and fundamental and crucial for all of this. And so I want to help people think well in general. And then we begin to work on thinking well about faith, and then we begin to, to, to apply both of those to thinking about well about living and how we live, but I think they all go together, and we need to, we need to uh, approach them in a kind of coherent way, so that's why I, that's why I do it the way I do it. Mm-hmm. We talk about keeping their sanity through college and university, so I, you know, one of the things you describe is you want people who are reading the book not just to survive, but to thrive, and you kind of talk about, just in the intro there, or the first chapter of your book, keeping their sanity. Talk about the significance significance of that word sanity and, and how you're using it there. Sure. It's, uh, if the goal is to survive, if, if the goal is merely not to lose your mind, your faith, or your character, uh, you could just approach it the way I think a lot of Christians, in fact, do approach college, which is the goal is to survive. And so what, I, what I'm going to do is keep my head down. I'll go into class. I won't look around. I won't really listen. I'll just, uh, you know, kind of take notes, take the exam, won't really think about it, and then I'll scurry out at the end of the lecture and just try to keep things intact. Well, that's survival of a, of a sort, but college is way too... Uh, well, it's way too expensive <laughs> to waste it on that, <laughs> one thing. Uh, but I think college is a great thing, and I, I want people to 
love what is good about it. It's one of the most important times, perhaps the most important time in, in, in a person's life. It's when you, uh, as my brother likes to put it, uh, master, mate, and mission. You settle those three big M's uh, in college, typically. You figure out what you want to do. Uh, very often you meet the person with whom you're going to do it. And it's a fundamental time for determining the master, you know, what, what you actually believe about things and why, and moving from your parents' faith, perhaps, to your own, and in any case, just wrestling with that. And so that's a good thing. It's a really good thing to wrestle with those things. And so what I, the, the sort of vision I want to cast is not merely to, to get through without harm, but actually to love it, to flourish. And the word sanity comes from a Latin word that, that means that. It's, we, we use it to talk about health, which is what it means. It's when, the, when we are functioning properly. And so sanity is, is, is more than just avoiding insanity, so to speak. Hmm. It's, it's a flourishing. It's a positive vision. And um, so that's what I'm trying to cast here. Is, is basically the, the subtitle of the book is, is uh, A Student's Guide to Thinking and Living Well. It's, it's, it's how to flourish in each of these areas, mind, faith, and character. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll just, I, I can't, I can't uh, avoid throwing in uh, something along these lines that uh, once I was introduced, uh, when I was speaking in a church and this doctor was introducing me, <clears throat> and he appealed to a definition he had heard someone give of college education. Uh, college education is that process whereby the notes of the professor become the notes of the student without passing through the mind of either. <laughs> and uh, all too often that's true. And if, if, you're, if it's a merely a survival mentality, that's exactly what you're after. Mm -hmm. But that's a waste of time and money. It's a oh. waste of time and money and opportunity. Mm. Well, I want to make sure that our listeners understand your uh, background. Can you talk just a bit about your educational uh, experiences and uh, from your time at Oxford and studying in the U.S. as well? Yes. When I, I did my undergrad at a state university, Colorado State University, and uh, I showed up on campus far better prepared than most students because I had a very strong church background, uh, good teaching. My brother was involved in campus ministry, so I knew, I already knew people. By the time I got there, um, I immediately got plugged into some fellowship and so on. But I got uh, confronted by intellectual objections uh, to the Christian worldview immediately, and I took them seriously, and I couldn't find people, even though there were plenty of godly people around and good, good souls. Uh, that, that had thought through these things and could help me with them. And so I moved into a, a kind of period of, of mild agnosticism. And uh, thankfully, by the providence of God, uh, an organization called Probe Ministries was just beginning, and they came to our campus, and a group of Christian intellectuals spoke in a number of classrooms and then gave a, an apologetics weekend conference. And I was able to learn how to think about these things and really those were the seeds that that have now uh, uh, borne fruit in this book because i i discovered several things i discovered some distinctions some ways of thinking some conceptual stuff that enabled me to think well about it uh, i met people who were good thinkers who loved god loved people but were ruthlessly committed to truth and that all those things were coherent to them and they lived it out and they, they cared about the gospel and, uh, and I, th I thought, you know, that's the kind of person I'd like to be like and then I discovered books and tools that they had and realized that there's a, there is a whole intellectual Christian uh, arena that, of which I was un, unaware largely um, a, a community that I could be a part of so that was really foundational, and that's really what started all this. Uh, I went into campus ministry work myself in the United States and Europe, 
and then I went to, uh, I, I did a master's degree uh, in a theological seminary in philosophy and, and theology, and then I went to Oxford for two degrees, uh, a master's in philosophical theology and a doctorate in philosophy. And then I was a, a visiting scholar at the University of Colorado when I came back and taught in that context. So I've, I've taught in a number of secular arenas, including Oxford, and, and Christian arenas. And I've been confronted with just about everything that there is, and I've, I've been able to be involved in the lives of students in all of those arenas. And so, again, all, all that whole experience, obviously, uh, lies behind my motivation to get some of this on paper, some of the things that I've seen be helpful to people uh, so that they can, they can flourish in college. Mm-hmm. Well, that does tie in uh, to one of the quotes that I want to read that's in the book in the first chapter there. And, you know, it's basically speaking about the Christian roots of a lot of our educational system. So here's, here's just a quote. It says, Let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ which is eternal life, and therefore to lay Christ in in the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. And seeing the Lord only giveth wisdom, let everyone seriously set himself by prayer in secret to seek it of him. And that's the rule of Harvard College in 1646. Do you want to talk a bit about the spiritual and Christian roots of our, of many of our universities? I'd love to. Uh, my alma mater, Oxford, is one of the earliest universities, uh, around 1200, and its motto is Dominus Illuminatio Mea, uh, the Lord is my light, and it's the first uh, words in the Clementine Vulgate uh, Latin translation of Psalm 27.1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? And the, the medieval Christians uh, learned these Latin tags for the first few words of these psalms. And so everybody who, who read that, the motto of Oxford during the first few hundred years that it existed, knew exactly what it was about. They knew this was Psalm 27, that this is a vision of a community, an intellectual community formed to think out all areas of knowledge uh, from a distinctively Christian perspective, from in, within the light of the Lord, it's a it's an awesome uh, vision for education, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, the the early universities like Oxford are inventions of the Christian Church, uh, and. They were they were formed as uh, along the model of guilds like uh, you know like harp makers or something like that communities of people who would uh, the masters would apprentice uh, the novices to learn the skills of thinking well the skills of study and so on so that they could become masters and, and teach others. Uh, but it was explicitly and deeply and thoroughly Christian. And when the people came over to the United States, uh, or North America, the Puritans in particular uh, brought this model with them. And uh, I, in fact, I just happened to be reading today uh, um, from a tract that uh, was published in London in 1643, dealing with the climate products and religion of New England and kind of describing things. And there's a little uh, section in this at the very beginning. It's called New England's First Fruits. And it says this, After God had carried us safe to New England and we had built our houses, provided necessaries for our livelihood, reared convenient places for God's worship, and led the civil government, one of the next things we longed for and looked after was to advance learning and perpetuate it to posterity, dreading to leave an illiterate ministry to the churches when our present minister shall lie in the dust. <laughs> hmm. And so they saw it as 
a central part of their mission to to educate, to raise up uh, godly ministers and godly scholars. And uh, almost all, all but just a handful of the early American universities were established by Orthodox Christians for this explicit purpose of glorifying God through through learning and the equipping of ministers and scholars. So I think it's important for people to recognize that not only is is Christianity compatible with the intellectual life and with the pursuit of learning and so on, but actually that's in the very DNA of, of who Christians are. There's no uh, institution in the history of the planet that has done more for education, for literacy, than the Christian church. Uh, I have a friend who teaches at Yale, and he he says that Sam Harris uh, can read today because of Christianity. And there's a lot of truth to that. And so, you know, what, what I want Christian students to, to recognize is that, yes, it can be a pretty hostile environment. It can be a place where it's, it can be easy to lose your mind, your faith, or your character. And there are, there are huge challenges, which is why I'm writing the book. But the fact is, this is not, uh, this is not an alien arena where we don't belong. Actually, we do. Uh, this, is, this is home in many ways for us. And our, our goal should not be to, you know, take it and try to take it back for Jesus, you know, and just complain about secularism and all that and, and get mad at everybody because, as I say in the book, as I argue in the book, to a great extent the reason secular professors don't say much about Christianity or they're, they're not positive toward it and so on, to a great extent that's because we have abandoned the university and the marketplace of ideas. They don't, they don't know any better. Uh, some of them are, you know, they're, they're not playing fair, but many of them are. They're good-hearted people, but they just don't know any better because we haven't been there. So our, our goal shouldn't be to, to, you know, just to blast it. What we should do, the, the, the model that I advocate in the book is the Daniel model. Daniel and his friends succeeded in the University of Babylon, as it were, uh, not by picketing and complaining, but by uh, out thinking, you know, by their own excellence. They outthought, outlived, uh, outperformed uh, their, their peers, and they won the respect legitimately of their peers and glorified God in, in, the, in the process. So that's what I think we ought to do, uh, not, not sort of militantly try to take back the university, but recognize this is, this is uh, a very Christian thing to do to take ideas seriously, to take scholarship seriously, and we should winsomely, excellently seek to love God with our minds in that arena, and hopefully then, in, a, in, a, in the right way, we might, uh, by the grace of God, take it back. Well, excellent. I think that's good stuff, and I particularly like the Daniel model that you uh, present throughout the book. Uh, we're talking about Mind Your Faith, a student's guide to thinking and living well. What I'm hoping to do as, I, as we go along in this interview is just to touch on some of these themes that you cover in the book, uh, obviously not to give away the content. One of the things you do, of course, as you've mentioned, is you devote that uh, a larger portion of the book to thinking well. Sketch out some of the goals you have in that portion, the content that you explore. Why is this such an important part of the book do you think, as far as pr preparing students for what they're going to face in university or college? I think that's, that so much of what, pe what people struggle with is based on misconceptions about things like faith, what it is, reason, what it is, science, what it is, and so on, that just thinking well about those things would solve an inordinate a lot of problems um, and so there's some things that we need to get clear on and then there's some skills that we need to develop and if, if, if students and non-students uh, can get good at those things they're, they're, 
you know, miles ahead to to uh, flourish in other areas of, of their lives. And I, I should just mention that even though I wrote this for students and as they're in the bullseye here, um, these are things that we all need to to know and practice. And uh, so I know you have a lot of uh, listeners and, and followers of, of of the work that you do that are not students. Uh, that I hope could could uh, profit from this. There's a there's a, a woman uh, in our Sunday school class who's uh, older, who has uh, been reading this book and and trying to apply it. And she's been talking to a new age guy and stuff, and she's so excited about just asking Socratic kind of questions and seeing what's happening. But uh, what here's here's kind of the goal for the for the mind the thinking part of it. I, I would uh, say there are three concepts that I think each of us really needs to get clear on. Truth, belief, and knowledge. And then there are three thinking skills that I would like to see people learn to cultivate and master. Uh, thinking contextually, thinking logically, and thinking worldviewishly. Obviously, these aren't the only things that are good to know as skills and thinking, but they're, it seems to me they're, they're pivotal. And in terms of, of what I'm looking for at the other end, one, one way of thinking of that is besides just loving God with our minds, being like Jesus, who, as Dallas Willard says, is the smartest guy who ever lived and thought logically and so on. Um, it, I think it's helpful to think about the, the, what Aristotle says are the three elements, the kind of three core elements of what we call Aristotelian logic. Terms, propositions, and arguments. We, terms are, are concepts we put together in, in a certain way to make propositions, and we put propositions together in, certain, in a certain way in a kind of structure to get arguments so we can, we can make inferences from propositions to other propositions. And reasoning involves those three elements chiefly, terms, propositions, and arguments. So a good thinker is going to be one who, who is, asks good questions and so on, is able to not to be satisfied when terms are ambiguous or fuzzy or are not being used consistently and so on. So that's part of it, just to, just to really develop a nose for clarity when it comes to concepts and asking good questions about that. What do you mean by that? Uh, and then when it comes to propositions, assertions like God exists, uh, that they would be, with the goal there for Aristotle would be that the propositions would be true or rationally justified. So asking questions like, how do you know that? What is your evidence for that? Um, at, you know, approaching thought in, in testing the truth of propositions, testing reasons for things, that's a huge part of thinking well. And then finally, that, that arguments would hold together, that they would be valid, that we, one would not move from uh, different premises to conclusions that are unwarranted and so on. So being able to ask things like, so what? How does that follow? What's your argument there? These are really fundamental uh, ways of thinking, but they are uh, almost you know, uh, unheard of in public discourse. So often the, the terms are just being used in a, in a sloppy way or the, the, the sense is being changed uh, of a term in mid-conversation and so on, or nobody's asking, but how do you actually know that? And explain your argument to me. So if if just people could learn to do that well, that would be a huge goal. I, I would like to see it be even more than that. But that's one reason why I spend so much time on it, because that sort of stuff needs to get unpacked. Um, and I it, So there's a lot of philosophy in the book although I'm trying not to make it a philosophy book that has a bunch of lingo in it. I can't avoid all of it, but I'm trying to put it into normal terminology so that normal people can, can pick up on it. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in these particulars, these 
top three that you've chosen there, uh, you know, in good thinking, where, you, for instance, the chapter on thinking logically, we give so much practical advice, and you talk about asking good questions and giving good reasons. Can you just elaborate a bit on the practical elements that you touch on there in your thinking logically section? Sure. Probably the big idea to take away is uh, the importance of asking good questions. And Socrates, of course, is, is well known for that. We, we talk about the Socratic method. But the other guy in history that's best known for asking good questions is Jesus. And uh, asking, asking a really good question, uh, in many cases, is, is worth uh, hours of, of pontificating on things. Uh, but not every question is a good question. Um, so what are good questions? Well, I tie the, the critical thinking questions or the Socratic questions, whatever you want to call them, that I suggest there. I, I give three kinds of questions, and they, they tie to what I was saying before. Um, what do you mean? And they were asking for clarity. Uh, very often we can be ships passing in the night, and uh, so I ask this all the time. And I ask it of myself. I ask it of what I write. I ask it of other people. I'm sure I, I, I'm sure I ask this multiple times a day, and I'm sure I don't ask it enough uh, because we, uh, I will assume that I know what somebody's talking about, and they may well not be asking or talking about that. So I've become much more sensitive over the years to miscommunication, but I know I'm not as sensitive as I ought to be. And, and uh, this really helps in, in marriage communication, by the way. So it, it, it doesn't need to be done, and in fact, it shouldn't be done in a hostile way. It should be the seeking of understanding. But what, what you know, explain that to me again. Um, make sure I'm understanding it. Uh, the second question, the second kind of question, which can be asked in many different ways, is, is how do you know that? What are your reasons for that? Could you explain to me how you arrived at that conclusion? That sort of thing. And then the so what question, which is is really got a couple of roles. One is to say, well, can you explain to me how what your argument is is there? How do how do you reach that conclusion? Or you can you can also use it to say, um, have you what are what are the implications of your view? Um, okay, so you hold that view. So what? What difference does that make in your life? If, can you have you lived that out? Can you live that out? It's such a helpful skill I found because, um, especially when we're talking about apologetics, it, it's really easy to think. You know, I can't really do apologetics if I don't know. You know, if I don't have a PhD or I don't know everything about this. Um, and we're afraid that we're, we'll say something wrong and we won't have the answers and so on. But I have found that I can, I've had many, many conversations with people about all kinds of things that I knew very little about. Uh, but I asked questions. I just saw my role here is to ask questions and to follow the argument where it goes. And it affirms people. It, uh, shows that I'm interested in them and and you know the more you do it the more interested you actually are in people uh, so I don't I don't practice this thinking okay I'm just gonna um, I'm gonna get them talking a little bit while I come up with my big slam dunk that I'm gonna use I really want to know but I also I want to ask the sorts of questions that will naturally allow the argument to surface and go someplace and so it's a great life skill, as well as an apologetic strategy, uh, as well as just a good thinking strategy, to ask good questions, try to, uh, again, clarify concepts, test the truth or justification of propositions, and uh, test the validity of arguments, of, of structures of reasoning, to see if conclusions actually follow from premises and so on. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a lot of great content, and, you know, as I look at portions of the book, I can't help but think about 
say, James Sire and his emphasis on worldviews or Greg Kokel and his tactics. And there are, there are even influences, as you mentioned, uh, Dallas Willard there. There are a lot of great, powerful concepts that, once grasped, uh, enable you to use them in, in uh, just a broad variety of other areas of your life. So as you mentioned, you know, it doesn't just apply to students, although I, I believe we should all be lifelong learners. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, and the other thing I would say about the book is that maybe some publishers would really try to make this cool and hip, but <laughs> it's uh, it's presented in a real mature way. It's It's not trying to be the latest, coolest looking thing. This is just solid, good material. Uh, so I do appreciate that about the book. Now, I want to talk about one other... I had a question about doubts, because you, you do deal with um, the elements of faith, as you mentioned, and how students can deal with doubts. And what came to mind as I was composing this question was a whole list of pressures that could contribute to the whole doubt problem. Not only do students have intellectual challenges on one side, which hit them with intellectual reasons to doubt, but there are moral challenges, temptations, things warring against their soul, and I think often wearing them down spiritually, and they're perhaps away from their home church they grew up in, away from their family, maybe even mocked for being a Christian. So that's a lot of pressure coming from a number of angles, not to mention just total life adjustment of being at a university along with its workload, and as I was thinking about this question, I realized that the whole book is sort of the answer or, or you know, something that will benefit someone as they're coming into that sort of situation. In, in essence, their big picture problem of dealing with this whole scenario is all of this content that you cover in the book. So adequately preparing students in the mind, faith and character. So but back to doubts in, you know, specifically uh, what sort of advice do you have for students who are going to face these inevitable challenges and maybe face these doubts? Well, I appreciate, first of all, that you you see that the whole book is an answer to that. <laughs> uh, that very wise observation, I might add. Um, because, you know, if we just think of doubts as as being the product of intellectual objections uh, to the faith, then we will miss what in many cases is much more significant uh, moral pressures sociological pressures um, we you know this is one of the problems that you know and again that that is why I, I wrote the book the way I did um, but the you know one of the experiences that students have at a secular university is the um, the, so the moral pressure uh, of opportunities to um, to um, you know to behave immorally, sexually, with drugs and so on. The pressure for cheating and all that kind of stuff. There's just a tremendous amount of moral pressure, but there's also sociological pressure in that now you have um, all these smart people who are your professors uh, that are respected and a kind of community that's oriented around them and around a, a set of values that very often is, it, at best, it doesn't acknowledge God, doesn't acknowledge the Christian worldview, and at worst uh, will be opposed to it um, or even mock it. And just the sociological pressure of wanting to fit in, of 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 you know having role models that that are no longer your pastor or youth leader or something like that that's huge that's huge and so one of the things that that I stress in the book that's re related to this is community it's so important for uh, Christians to be in community with other people and I want to encourage Christians to read the book together and to, to really help each other with this, to start thinking through issues together, to be praying with each other, to encouraging, to reading other books together, and, you know, in a way changing their sociology, so to speak, recognizing that this is a fact and, you know, the only, the only sort of 
adequate response to the sociological pressures is a, a kind of counterculture where you're you're pursuing this together with somebody else and reading books by people who and this is what I discovered when I was a freshman once I just I mean it wasn't even just what these books said but it was the existence of these books of Christian intellectuals who had thought through this stuff and, oh yes okay there is a there's a broader world out there that I've kind of forgotten about that I can kind of balance off against where I am right now and I can I can kind of look objectively at where I am now and the Lord knows we need we need a community to help handle the moral pressures um, to help people keep us accountable I was uh, when I taught at a secular university I had uh, one of my students had taken a class and she reported to me that the professor right at the beginning of the semester said there are at least five genders uh, and you don't know which one you are in fact you just you you what you ought to do is just try them all and then choose one or two <laughs> and um, and so by the way we're having a party this Friday night where you can try them all <laughs> unbelievable and uh, I just thought I, I wonder what her dad would say <laughs> right now <laughs> who's probably paying the bill for this well I mean that's that combines the moral and sociological pressure here's a guy with a PhD uh, who's valued in the university, playing this role of respect and so on, and he must know something, must know what he's talking about, and all these students are kind of nodding their head yes, uh, and and then there's the moral pressure to hey you know it's okay just try try whatever you want and, and that's okay, and um, so in in that case there was no explicit. Uh, intellectual objection to the Christian worldview. It was all implicit as far as that goes, but it was it was explicit moral and sociological pressure, if if that actually is sensible. Since I, I think moral and sociological pressure are not explicit, but that's that's full on uh, moral and sociological pressure. Now all of that leads to doubt. They're related. If you if you are struggling with whether or not the Christian worldview is correct morally speaking because you're you're involved in immoral behavior or you're just being pushed along by moral pressure or just your hormones are, are going nuts uh, that and, and you act on that that's going to lead to intellectual doubt uh, and calling into question the Christian worldview as a whole and again, sociological uh, pressures are, are kind of implicit and under the surface, and they just they just kind of take the edge off it and, 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 and make it seem implausible. Uh, because surely, if it were if it were plausible, if it were true, then then like on a Christian radio station, you'd be hearing about it all the time. And uh, secular environments like that play mostly a kind of sociological role there. So it, we would be foolish not to keep all of that in mind. So I stress, in general, you know, a, having a, a holistic, uh, integrated picture of these things of where our thinking, our believing, our acting are all integrated and makes sense. It's that this is what life is about. This is a flourishing life. And, but being then in community, holding each other accountable, helping each other develop this countercultural uh, worldview, and working through it. And then specifically, when it comes to you know specific doubts that are perhaps more intellectual in character, I want to say first of all that doubt doubt is inevitable. Uh, it's part of just being finite. First of all, uh, and and some doubt is good. Uh, if you never doubted, it meant it would mean you never thought. And not every proposition that is asserted to be true is true. And so, you know, this is why we need to think well. We need to be able to test the truth of things. And so if we, if we really are asking good questions and weighing the evidence for things and so on, we will be doubting. Uh, 
And I call that logical doubt. Logical doubt is good. It's just wondering what's true, testing uh, propositions, uh, clarifying concepts, testing arguments, and so on. The problem is when you when you move into psychological doubt, which is where you you begin to doubt for the sake of doubt. You you refuse to uh, accept. You refuse to be to to um, uh, hold to things that you have plenty of good reason to hold to be true. Mm-hmm. And uh, that you know that that's kind of a a, a, a spin down into the in, to dis, a descent into the darkness. Um, G.K. Chesterton famously said, I think it was of uh, George Bernard Shaw, that um, the purpose of an open mind is is like that of a per- is like that of an open mouth. It's is to close it again on something that's solid. Being open minded is is a virtue if you're looking for truth. It's not a virtue if you found it. And so one of the things we need to do with respect to doubt is we need to doubt our doubts we need to we need to be willing to commit to what we do know to be true and not descend into kind of a, a posture of doubt of psychological doubt where we're unwilling to believe what we have good reason uh, to believe and again and again community community can help us with that when I went through my uh, season of doubt in college uh, just by the grace of God, I, I hadn't really thought about all this stuff. I just somehow I knew that if this is true, I'm not going to find out in a bar. I'm going to find out from people who actually have had some experience of God. And so even though I, I stopped witnessing and, and, and so on, I, I still hung out with people. I even went with people witnessing. <laughs> just sat there. And um, I now look back on it and think that yeah, was crucial uh, because we're all at different phases and, and sometimes I'm struggling and and you aren't and so you can help me and sometimes you're struggling and I'm not and I can help you and one of the things that we help each other do is uh, remember who God is, remember what the evidence is and so on, but also um, you know kind of call each other if we're um, if we're descending into psychological doubt, or we're we're put we're not doubting our doubts enough, that sort of thing. Well, I have another quote that I wanted to read that you include in the book, and this time it's in your final section about character, and it kind of relates to you know these moral elements you're talking about, and it's from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He says, "The essential thing about chastity." is not a renunciation of pleasure, but an all-encompassing orientation of life toward a goal. Where there is no such orientation, chastity inevitably deteriorates into the ridiculous. So, uh, you know, as you mentioned throughout the book, as you're using this biblical character of Daniel as a sort of template, um, can you talk about this section on character just a bit and how you're encouraging students or to approach their own character? Yes, and this is uh, this is actually what I, you know, my academic specialty more <laughs> uh, is in ethics and especially classical uh, ethics, ancient medieval approaches to it. And this is exactly the way they thought about it, and I believe it's the way the Bible approaches it. And that is... And, and it fits into the whole idea of, of sanity and flourishing. That you look at the, the book of Proverbs, and the fundamental contrast is not between right and wrong, although it's there. It's between life and death. And so it's a choice between paths. And if you choose the path of folly, uh, you know, you, it's death. It's death to relationships. It's, it's, it's death on many levels. And there's nothing there. Uh, life is is the the path of wisdom is the path of life. It's the way, literally, a way of life. And um, I this has been hugely influential to me personally, uh, as I've struggled with temptations and sins in my life and so on, is to realize that that what God has revealed in Scripture, the the, his, the design plan. I mean, He's created me to live in a certain way to flourish as his child. That doesn't mean life is easy. 
we live in a fallen world and you know, full of sickness and 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 persecution and so on. But he has, he calls us to life, to intimacy with him, to um, experiencing what is good, and uh, and living it out, living out a character that's good and so on. And it's it's a life worth living. It's attractive. It's it's what we were made for. And so saying that means we have to say no to some things if we're going to say yes to what's good. Uh, but I fear that we often approach ethics in most of the, most of these students probably this is what they heard or this may be what they heard uh, growing up in church uh, I know many people have is it's all about saying no so just don't you know don't commit adultery etc and and then after that well we don't have a heck of a lot to say and when it comes to sex just say no and you know that's not a very motivating uh, understanding of life and uh, in the heat of the moment and with passions flaring and, and temptations calling uh, it's not a very effective one either uh, But that, and it's also not biblical the biblical picture the, picture the picture we see for example in Proverbs is say yes this is life and so as, as Bonhoeffer you know, is saying there chastity as an end uh, is ridiculous if it's saying no it's 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 something that is a response to a, a much bigger yes a kind of vision of a flourishing life it's a life well worth living and and it's a life that that is a sexual life that has a, a certain nature to it and in order to flourish as sexual beings we have to live according to the nature that God created us. And so when we say no to sex outside of marriage, to perfect pornography, and all that, that kind of stuff, what we're saying no to is, is death. Uh, it, it's, it's allowing us to say yes to what's good. And I don't think we're going to make it, any of us, uh, very long if our stance in life is no, especially college students today, where the culture is just screaming yes to all these things. And, and it only makes sense to say no to those things that your hormones and your culture are screaming yes to. It only makes sense to say no to those if you're saying yes to something better. And it's easy to forget that, so we need, you know, we need God's spirit to to be fanning that vision into flame and we need to be in the word but we also need community to help each other remember the big yes uh, that makes sense out of the, the smaller no's that we need to say in order uh, to realize that great yes well and that's great stuff there well, the book is an excellent resource for students, um, so I'm commending it to those in or on their way to college or university life. And as kind of we've talked about it here, it's not really an apologetics book, but I think it's essential to guarding our own faith so that we can ultimately stand strong and then defend it and commend it to others. So, David, as we kind of wrap up here, I know you're a teacher there at Biola, which is the real hotbed for apologetics training. So lastly, what advice would you have for those who want to be better defenders of the faith? Oh, my. Well, um, follow what you're doing. That's a really good start. Uh, great resources there. I guess, um, I, you know, there are many things I would want to say. Um, Here's my latest thing that I'm thinking about in <laughs> apologetics, and it'll just tie it into what I was just just saying, and that is that um, the gospel uh, is more than uh, just the story of a transaction of Jesus taking our sins upon Himself, although it is is not less than that. Um, it's an invitation to live with Him in the kingdom and it's a, it's a it's life it's an invitation to life and so what we ought to do as apologists is uh, be able to defend um, you know the resurrection of Christ and so on but we also need to I think 
model and to point to and be able to articulate in creative ways uh, this this bigger vision of the good of the life in all of its aspects, including modeling it uh, in the way we care for the poor and people with pressing needs and and so on. All of that is pointing to the to the truth of uh, the goodness, truth, and beauty of God. And so, what I would encourage people to, I guess, is, um, is is have a rich picture of apologetics and and just ask God uh, to make you um, the kind of person that, given your gifts and your situation, would be uh, most. Um, it would be most appropriate for you and be most effective for you to kind of play that role in pointing to the goodness, truth, and beauty about God. Well, excellent, and thanks for that, David. Finally, where where can our listeners uh, find your resources, and in particular, you know, resources on your book online? Okay, we have a we have a website, mindyourfaithbook.com, and uh, also there's a Facebook page or two, and I'm I have to. Um, confess that I'm pretty technically illiterate uh, on these matters, so I, I don't know how much. If I, but if you if you go to in Facebook and you go to Mind Your Faith book, uh, there are a couple different sites there for the book and for a kind of discussion and that and so on. And I on on those sites as well as on the MindYourFaithBook.com, uh, I have a f- uh, more thorough bibliography that will be. Uh, updated regularly of um, many different sources that I recommend in these different areas Uh, and then uh, also uh, coming uh, not quite here yet uh, study questions and ideas and I'm beginning to blog for uh, Evangelical Philosophical Society and so um, when that starts here pretty soon they can they can start following that that sort of stuff for me. Well, David, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, and I hope the book gets into the hands of many people. And thanks for taking the time to do the interview. Oh, you're more than welcome. Thank you so much for all the work you do. God bless you. I have been speaking with David Horner, Professor of Philosophy and Biblical Studies at Biola University. He is a research scholar for Centers for Christian Study International, developing intellectual Christian communities within secular university contexts. He's author of Mind Your Faith, A Student's Guide to Thinking and Living Well, which can be found in links at today's blog post at Apologetics 315. This podcast marks about 100 interviews with Christian apologists, scholars, theologians, philosophers, authors, and other defenders of the faith. Do you have a recommendation for someone you'd like to hear interviewed? If so, feel free to send an email to interviews at apologetics315.com. Did you know that there are other podcasts by Apologetics 315, all in iTunes? Just search for Apologetics 315 in iTunes to find them. And they include How to Get Apologetics in Your Church, Is Christianity True, Logical Fallacies 1, and Logical Fallacies 2, Fallacy Friday, Read Along with Apologetics 315, Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology Lectures, and this podcast, Apologetics 315 Interviews. One thing that helps get the word out about resources like this interview is your help by sending links, tweets, and Facebook updates to your friends on the web. So if you found this resource helpful, please take a few seconds to share it, as you never know who you might benefit. I also encourage you to be a friend on Facebook or Twitter for more daily links to the best resources and articles in Christian apologetics. Also, please do pray for this ministry as it continues to grow. And if this ministry has been a blessing to you, please send an email or leave a comment to let us know. This is Brian Auten of Apologetics 315, and thanks for listening.